thank you all for sticking around so close to lunch. Um, so an important uh, part of this title is low logistical costs. So I've put up this picture of uh, our setup in Greenland in 2014 in which we piloted a probe, a melt probe, to 400 meters depth. Um, keep that in mind as I show you some other drilling out, uh, operations in a couple of minutes. Um, so uh, Tim Elam and Justin Burnett and I are responsible for this narrow part of the work that I'm going to discuss today. But uh, this, this part of the work sits within the context of a broader portfolio of projects funded by NASA and by NSF and involving uh, a number of co-eyes that I want to uh, acknowledge. Jill McCuckey and her student Caleb Schuler are um, helping us to develop microbial clean sampling in this sort of uh, probe. Uh, Scott Tyler and John Selker are helping us develop um, Raman distributed temperature sensing so that we can measure temperature profiles everywhere between the surface of the ice and the probe as it descends. Uh, ben Hill and Paul Kintner are a couple of students that I've worked with in developing numerical modeling that, uh, for the closure of the melt hole and what happens when you have uh, antifreeze in it, as you'll see in a minute. And uh, Paul Kintner and Nick Wogan also have helped with experiments. Oops. So uh, to start out, I want to emphasize the science driver for this work. Um, there are, beneath the Antarctic ice sheet, there are at least 400 subglacial lakes. Uh, they are variously connected by uh, streams and rivers and maybe marshes. They are uh, a very diverse group of, of water bodies, ranging in size up to sort of Lake Ontario size, in the case of Lake Vostok. Um, and the point is that these things are geochemically and geophysically quite various. Some of them have melting going on at their lids, so they have oxygen inputs. Some of them have other sorts of varying geochemical inputs. So they are 400 natural laboratories for understanding how life may work under ice um, in various ways. And I think that that is critical to understand how life may work as we start to think about the outer solar system and modeling Europa and Enceladus, and modeling, or how we would go about analysis of plume material from those places. So 400 lakes, 400 very different places, you need to sample some fair fraction of them to learn what they have to tell you. And the problem is that current methods for sampling those lakes are expensive. Um, a good example of this is the recent Wizard project, which uh, more recently has become the Salsa project, um, sampling two lakes in West Antarctica beneath 800 meters of ice. Um, these were scientifically extremely productive uh, projects, but they are expensive on the order of $10 million, so that means that you're not going to go to very many places this way, especially not um, very fast if we're interested to try to get information and insight prior to um, missions to the outer solar system. So, oops. so we've been uh, developing a, a, an alternative way to get into some larger fraction of those 400 lakes. Um, and in particular, this is a thermal melt probe, so it's, it's, uh, it melts its way down into the ice using electrical power supplied from the ice surface. Um, and this is our setup, again, in Greenland. So there's just a tent with some high voltage uh, power supplies, some Honda generators, some fuel depot, and the ice diver. This is the whole kit to get to 400 meters. It was about half a he uh, Bell helicopter load, typical Air Greenland Bell helicopter. Um, and so this is logistically much lighter. Um, that means we can go more places. And uh, one other thing to think about here is that thus far, this may, may change, but thus far, um, this kind of melt probe is the, the only technology that has been demonstrated to penetrate to hundreds of meters in the ice with near autonomy. So that has continued to make it a candidate component technology for a Europa system. Um, 
However, a classical thermal melt probe lets the ice above the, the probe as you descend freeze. So you don't get it back. It's not recoverable. And that means that we can't use it to go into Antarctic subglacial lakes because certainly no one's going to let us leave a probe in the lake and pollute it. Uh, and also, you can't get samples back. So we have started to develop uh, an extension to this technology based on this idea. So the, the key idea here is that the melt hole doesn't refreeze instantly as you go down. It takes hours, even at East Antarctic temperatures. And so you can inject an antifreeze, in particular ethanol is a good antifreeze, I'll explain why in a minute, um, to arrest the, the hole refreezing. And then you can deploy cable from the surface. You don't have to carry it all in the vehicle. So you can keep a small vehicle and go deep with all of the logis logistical advantages inherent in that. You can recover samples, and you also get to deploy fibers that would be hard to fit into your vehicle, like fiber optic cable, to do this temperature measurement. So the, the schematic idea here is that the probe goes down, and we inject this ethanol at some distance above it. Um, we choose ethanol because it's lighter than water. And ice sheets are colder at the top than they are at the bottom, so you need more antifreeze at the top. And you want that to float on the more dilute solution beneath. So ethanol is uh, a more miraculous material than perhaps you realized. However, some of you might be hot water drillers or you might know hot water drillers who will tell you that, wait a minute, if you pour ethanol down a melt hole, you'll get a hole full of slush and everything will just be clogged up. So you might be skeptical of this solution that I've just outlined for you. Let me explain based on numerical uh, modeling and now lab work that we've done, why we, we think that is, that the hot water drillers do get holes full of slush and why we can avoid that. So here is the situation just after you've drilled a hole. You have a column full of water at zero C and there's some warm ice outside the hole and out here at the far field there's some distant temperature. That's the ice sheet temperature at that depth. What you really would like, ideally, is to wave a wand and just have everything be isothermal with antifreeze in this hole. Of course, you can't quite do that. So, but the point is that hot water drilling warms up ice outside the hole quite a bit because of the operational way it's done. They hold the hole open, they ream the hole. So there's quite a bit of heat stored outside here. And then, if you dump antifreeze in there, this is a lot like putting rock salt into crushed ice in, in an old style ice cream maker you immediately drop the temperature of that solution. You take energy out of the bonds in the ice and drop this temperature. So what I'm going to do here is in this progression, the light gray is the previous panel's temperature profile and the black one is the current one. So you, you drop this, you, you put, drop the antifreeze in, you immediately lower the temperature of this, but you've still got this warm ice outside. And this ice is above the temperature that this stuff wants to dissolve. So it starts to eat out. It starts to erode the whole wall. And as long as there is ice that is, in a sense, too warm out here, this erosion continues until you get to a situation like this. And now the problem arises that uh, you start to freeze back and you exclude antifreeze back into the hole. But that molecular diffusion, the chemical diffusion, is much slower than the temperature diffusion. So you end up with a lot of antifreeze here, not so much there, but it's cold everywhere. So you start to form slush in this hole. A, hot, a, um, a melt probe has a natural advantage in this situation because if you go down at meters per hour, and notice I'm saying meters per hour, not centimeters per hour, which is sometimes what we discuss in the planetary context because of power restrictions. But if you go down at meters per hour, you heat up much less ice and you don't have to keep things open like you do in hot water drilling. So you, you have a natural advantage. You've, put, you've stored much less heat out here. Now you put in this antifreeze, but you can put it in pretty quickly behind the probe. And so you greatly limit this area. And so when you get over here, you have a much more even antifreeze uh, distribution. And so that's why we, we think that we can get away without making slush. And we tested this first in the laboratory. This is case we put some 
red food coloring in the water so that you could see it. But the, the hole in this laboratory block refreezes symmetrically, and then we stopped it with ethanol, and we didn't make slush, but in the laboratory we had a hard time to keep the slush in the, the hole, the ice block cracked. So we have gone on to test this at an ice drilling program test facility, that's an NSF sponsored test facility in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, with a full scale ice diver. So you see here, this, this is the thing that is used to um, inject the ethanol. There's a, this is the top of the ice diver. There's a, a melt head there that's conical in case there is some refreezing. So we can melt and come back out. The, the ice column's 14 meters high. We, we injected ethanol at zero C during the descent. We got temperature measurements along the cable. And um, the upshot was that we got down, the tip of the probe was at eight meters depth. Uh, we know that there wasn't slush in the hole because we sampled it with a cup. Um, so we brought up liquid from various depths. It was all clear. Later, when we, re we turned the temperature down in the hole, we could make slush, so we could compare to that. So we know that it was clear when we sampled it. And then we recovered the probe. Uh, and this is the temperature data. So there's some cooling near the top. It was minus 20 in Madison at the time that we did this last February. Uh, but over uh, most of the distance between the top of the column and the probe, the, the top of the probe is about minus uh, six meters, or six meters depth. Uh, we had temperatures between minus six and minus eight. So we have clear liquid at minus seven or so C uh, without making slush. So uh, the upshot is that we think it's important to explore these earth analogs. Uh, we think that we can demonstrate reliable operation to hundreds of meters of depth, but we, are, we need to develop this recoverability to explore those earth analogs in a way that will pass muster. Um, and the prospect is for penetration to kilometers depth with a small probe. Thank you. All right, we have time for a couple questions. Hi, um, Kay Craft. Um, <clears throat> really cool um, technology. Have you, um, and this wasn't part of your talk, but I'm curious about what are the sampling kind of technologies you've been looking at? Can you just speak to that for? Sure. Um, so what we're presently doing and working some kinks out of is to use uh, a port on the side of the vehicle and uh, a peristaltic pump. So that's a pump that's commonly used in medical applications, for instance. It allows you to sterilize the tube that goes through the pump and, you, and the rest of the pump never touches the fluid. And we put that into a, a bag that we autoclave. And um, yeah, we present at, with the present size, we have two of those units and they, they each acquire about 150 mils of sample. But, as I say, we, were, we have been exercising that in the field, including most recently in May on Easton Glacier in Washington State. Uh, we're still working on getting it working just right. I think it does overlap. My concern was how you prevent contamination, not just sterilizations, but also contamination control and bioburden monitoring. Yes, yes, very much so. So. Um, Actually, Caleb is in the back. Maybe, would you like to address that, Caleb? What was the exact question? The, the question is, how are we addressing forward contamination? And I thought maybe you'd talk about the, the doping and cleaning and the re Yeah, yeah, you know. so we have a uh, protocol we use for uh, cleaning it before we go into the ice. And um, we've also done some laboratory tests where we test the dragging of materials in the ice as the probe descends. And uh, we're working on some more uh, dye testing um, to kind of incorporate that with the ethanol uh, as we descend through ice as well. To, to look at mixing between possible liquid reservoirs in the system. But the, the uh, cleaning, the exterior cleaning that Caleb's alluding to is something that Jill McCuckey developed first in connection with the ice mole, ice mole the German melt probe at uh, Taylor Glacier in, in East Antarctica. So, and we, I mean, you have some very nice numbers about floors, right? Yeah, yeah, I can, can come talk to you. Yeah, we'll, okay. We'll let everybody get to lunch. Uh, thanks again to all of our presenters and a lot of cool work being presented. <laughs>